Can Wally, the true rival from Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, be able to conquer the Galar region if he moved there one day? Rules and our question of the day are in the description, and be sure to follow me on Twitch where I do these challenges live. So none of the starters here are Pokemon that Wally use, unfortunately, so let's fast forward to the wild area where we can actually catch our first two team members, Wally's actual starter, a Ralts, and a Badu. Ralts is much better than it used to be, seeing as it actually comes with confusion and disarming voice, and we do have a bit of an open-ended choice as to whether we want to stay as a guard of war or evolve into galley so that's something that we can look forward to a little bit later but it was also really good and we can finally evolve it this time seriously this is like my third time using a Badu, and only now can i actually evolve it in one of these challenge runs its learn set was heavily nerfed compared to fourth generation but if we can use the right tms and trs it can do pretty well aside from the fact that wally seems to have a more physically offensive roserade okay now if we were only playing the base game, this is actually all we'd have. Only two of Wally's eight total Pokemon that are used are available in the original Sword and Shield, but thankfully, practically the rest of them are all available in the DLC, specifically Shield's DLC. On the Isle of Armor, we managed to catch ourselves a Meryl, Magnemite, and Fletchling. Meryl can be an absolute menace thanks to its great water fairy typing, while also having the huge power ability which doubles its attack stat. We unfortunately got an attack lowering nature, but if I manage to find a nature mint somewhere, I'll be sure to use it. Magnemite is a great electric steel type and is going to give us some great resistances, and sadly we did get Magnet Pull, not sturdy, but Magnezone is going to be a fantastic teammate nonetheless. Fletchling is actually pretty solid too. I didn't know this, but it actually comes with Ember now, but sadly we are missing out on the heavily nerfed but still great Gale Wings ability, but Big Pecs and Flame Body eventually will have its uses. We also got ourselves a Gibble and a Swablu. Now, truthfully, you can obtain these this early in the Crown Tundra, but through Raid Dens. The only issue is that when you're running around the entire place without a bike, it is incredibly mentally draining when you go through various cycles of raids and you still don't find the raid that you're looking for. So I transferred in a Gibble and an Altaria, and I bred them to get our final two team members. I hope you'll forgive me. Swablu is one of those rare examples of a dragon type that's more defensive than offensive, but it's always been a favorite Gen 3 Pokemon of mine, so I'm actually looking forward to maybe using it. Gibble also has the potential to carry this entire run, obviously because it's a pseudo, but it won't really be able to pick up speed until we can evolve it into a Gabite at level 24. Until then, it's relatively weak. And that's it! Those are all the Pokemon Wally has used that are available in Sword and Shield. The only other Pokemon he's used that isn't available here is Delcaddy, but... Am I really missing out on much? I don't think so. Before challenging Milo, we got a few evolutions out of the way. Firstly, we evolved Meryl into Azumarill at level 18, since it's not really gonna be doing much for us until Kabu, and it also evolved super early, so I figured why not? We also evolved Fletchling into Fletchender at level 17, since I plan to use him for Milo. Azumarill has some pretty solid stats. It's got a lot more defensive prowess now, but huge power is still the thing that makes Azumarill an absolute force to be reckoned with, so I'm really excited to use this thing. Fletchender is a nice step up from Fletchling, and that added fire typing is nice, but again, it's a shame we don't have Gale Wings. But getting stabbed from Ember and Flame Charge is a nice plus, however. So our rules state that we can only go into each gym with the amount of Pokemon the gym leader has. So I decided to bring in Magnemite, since it resists everything Milo's team can throw at us, and Fletchender, since it can hit his team super effectively, albeit relatively weakly, with Flame Charge and Peck. But with this team, you can imagine that Milo served little to no challenge because of our lineup. Magnemite was able to take down Gossiflor, and Fletchender took down Eldegoss, winning us the first badge. After that gym, I got a little carried away, <laughs> and I evolved our Ralts into a Curlia, and then picked up the Dawnstone in the wild area in order to get ourselves a Gallade. I couldn't help myself. He's one of my absolute favorite Pokemon of all time, so I, I, I needed to have it. We lose out on the resourceful fairy type that Gardevoir would have had, but we instead get a nice fighting typing. It's also got a great attack stat and a great special defense stat, so I'm looking forward to using this thing again. Dang, it, it's crazy that we already have two fully evolved Pokemon on our team already. This is actually going to be a really fun run. On our way to Hullberry, Budu managed to evolve into Roselia. It's a massive step in the right direction for offensive prowess. It's just a shame that Wally's Roserade, like I said earlier, is more physically offensive, if anything. Literally, our only special attack that we can use is Shadow Ball. So that's concerning. Upon arriving in Hullberry, we took on Nessa and lost. 
twice. You'd think that with a Gallade with Leaf Blade and a Roselia, we wouldn't have any problems, right? Wrong. My first try resulted in me getting a little cocky and trying to set up to plus six with Gallade, but we ended up taking way too much damage from Goldeen and Aracuda, and we surprisingly did not outspeed Dreadnought. He took down Gallade and Azumarill, and Roselia followed suit. On our second attempt, I decided to not get greedy and just start off strong with Leaf Blade. Goldeen and Aracuda went down in one hit, and we did massive damage to Dreadnought, but after Gallade fell, I sent an Azumarill to finish it off, and we missed an Aqua Tail. So, we lost again. In case this kind of thing happened again, I let off with Roselia this time, and set up two layers of Toxic Spikes. That way, if we do miss an Aqua Tail, we can at least take Dreadnought down with Toxic Poison. But of course, Nessa doesn't even take down Gallade on our third attempt, and it goes down to two Leaf Blades. Well. <laughs> that was weird. I did not expect that to happen in the slightest. Now, before fighting Kabu, I decided to evolve Gibble into Gabite. It's not a massive power increase, but it's good to have for right now. We still can't learn Crunch, though. I've been holding on to that TR for what feels like forever, and with the Ghost Gym coming up, that move could be incredibly useful. Kabu was pretty easy. In order to avoid getting burned by Will-O-Wisp, I let off with Azumarill and immediately switched into Fletchender, since fire types can't be burned. Fletchender was able to take down Ninetales with a few acrobatics, and we did some good damage to Arcanine too. After Fletchender fainted, Azumarill took it out, followed by defeating Gigantamax, sent to Scorch. So I'm not gonna lie, I was a little worried about going into the fight with Alistair, mainly because we don't have anything for ghost types at the moment. The only option that we really have is Crunch, but the only team member who can learn it is Garchomp, which we're kind of far away from level-wise, uh, not sure if you've noticed. <laughs> so in order to prepare, I evolved Magnemite into Magneton at level 32, because I'm stupid and pressed B while it was evolving, and then I used a Thunderstone to evolve Magneton into Magnezone. This thing is incredibly sturdy and has a great typing with Electric and Steel. That quad weakness to ground is a little concerning, but I don't think we'll be running into many Pokemon with ground moves anytime soon. It's also got a really high special attack stat, which I plan to take full advantage of in the future. With Magnezone, Azumarill, Fletchender, and Roselia all leveled up to 32 and 30 respectively, I took a shot at Alistair, but I was not confident that we would win this. Let me just say, this battle was awesome. He starts off with his Galarian Yamask, and we easily took it down with Azumarill's Aqua Tail. However, we did have to switch out since we lost huge power due to Wandering Spirit, so I switched into Roselia to break the incoming Mimikyu's disguise. That's about all Roselia did, though, so we at least got a little bit of damage on it, if you count the 10% health lost from the disguise breaking as us doing damage. I went back to Azumarill to take it down with a few play roughs, but we unfortunately got hit with a baby doll eyes, lowering our attack, so we didn't even get a chance to take his Cursula down as that came out. This is where things got weird. We did a little less than half his health due to being at minus one attack, but then he used Curse to bring his health down to practically nothing. The problem, though, is that hitting Cursula activated its weak armor ability, and if you've watched my small Pokemon run, link in the iCard above, it lowers your defense but doubles your speed. Now, I know Cursula was kinda slow, but when it's double speed, I, I had a feeling that it would outspeed pretty much everything on my team. So, assuming that this attempt was forfeit, I sent in Fletchender and went for Flame Charge since we don't have any usable moves still. But we actually managed to outspeed. I guess I should have seen that coming, seeing as Fletchender is still pretty fast, but a Flame Charge took it out and that brought us to plus one speed. He then sends out his Gengar and Gigantamaxes. Now, here, I have the tough decision of whether I wanted to go for more damage with acrobatics or waste two turns with fly. I ended up going for the latter and we somehow managed to outspeed Gengar as well. So we wasted two of his Gigantamax turns and he thankfully went for Max Ooze on the turn we went up in the air and took us out with a G-Max Terror the following turn. You will see why this is incredibly important momentarily. With everything else knocked out, our last option is Magnezone, who I gave the Assault Vest to. He hits us with a G-Max Terror and we survive, but it did some absolutely massive damage. Flash Cannon doesn't do a good amount, but we were actually lucky enough to get the special defense drop, so victory was just within reach as long as we could survive his next move. He hits us with a Hex, and we lived on 4 HP, retaliating with another Flash Cannon, getting us the Ghost Badge. If he had gone for Max Ooze and landed it, 
we definitely would have lost since that raises your team's special attack by one stage. I really did not expect to win that first try, especially with being as underleveled as we are. I also evolved Fletchender into Talonflame at level 35, giving us finally another fully evolved team member. Since we don't have a hidden ability Talonflame, this thing's not as much of a threat as it could be, but that speed is absolutely incredible, even if I forget that its attack stat is much lower than I think it always is. The only downside to Talonflame is that the only offensive moves we can use use currently are Flare Blitz from relearning it at level 1, and Brave Bird, which we found a TR for. Those are moves that both do massive recoil damage to the user. The next usable move that we can use is Steel Wing, but we don't get that to level 56, so the run will practically be done by the time we get to that. Ah well, he's still gonna do wonders in the Fairy Gym against Mawile's Opal. I'm actually really glad that somebody spoke up about this, but shoutouts to Demon Monkey Man for reminding me that Bulbapedia actually has all the movesets for Wally's Pokemon from Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald straight to Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. I've been using Cerebi this whole time, so I couldn't really remember the moves his team used from the Game Boy games, but this thankfully opens up some much better offensive options for us with Roselia, since it can use Giga Drain and Magical Leaf now. And Altaria can also use Dragon Dance. I'm actually getting really excited now. This is a fun run. Opal is always an easy battle because of her quiz mechanic. Plus, we had a Steel type with Flash Cannon, so I really was not too concerned here. I tried taking down her Weezing with Roselia, but sadly, we got taken down before we had the opportunity to do so. Magnazone, however, was able to come out and take down her Weezing, Mawile, Togekiss, and Alchemy very easily. Again, super easy battle, only made easier by the boosts that she gives. Upon getting the Fairy Badge, we can pick up a Shiny Stone on Route 7 and finally evolve Roselia into Roserade. This is a massive step in the right direction for us in terms of offensive prowess, and I love using Roserade any chance I get, so I'm excited to use one again. It still sucks that our only offensive poison move that we can use is Poison Jab. Like, why did Wally not teach this thing Sludge Bomb or Venoshock? Like, come on now. Melanie didn't really give us much of a hassle either. Talonflame was able to take down her Frostmoth and Darmanitan with a Flare Blitz, and I sent out Magnezone to take out her Ice Q with a Flash Cannon in order to avoid activating its Ice Face ability. As Ice Q goes down, she sends out her Gigantamax Lapras, and we took it down with a few Thunderbolts thanks to a Lucky Paralysis. After defeating Melanie, I evolved Swablu into Altaria. Like I said earlier, it's a more defensive dragon type, so I'll try to use it when I can, but when we have a Garchomp on the horizon, I think we'll be using that a little more often. For the most part, Piers was actually pretty easy. Scrafty went down to two Moonblasts from Altaria while getting taken down by Malamar. Azumarill came out and took it down with a Play Rough. Out next is Obstagoon, and I wanted to try setting up with Gallade, but of course when we try to attack, Piers goes for Obstruct and then kills us the following turn with a Shadow Claw. Azumarill was able to come in and finish it off, but we definitely would have lost to Skuntank if we didn't have Earthquake, so Gabite took it down in two. Before Raihan, we evolved our Gabite into Garchomp, and at long last, our team is finally complete. This thing is one of the most iconic pseudo-legendaries for a reason, thanks to its incredible typing, access to some of the strongest moves in the game, and a very well-balanced stat spread, if I do say so myself. It feels so good to finally have this behemoth at my disposal. Raihan was pretty easy, but there was definitely some unintentional cheese here. So he leads off with his Gigalith and Flygon, like he always does, but his Gigalith has Sandstream, not Sturdy, so he always sets up a Sandstorm upon entry. Normally, I wouldn't really pay this much mind, but then his Flygon missed Breaking Swipe, and then his Sandaconda missed Glare. Uh, yeah, I completely forgot that our Garchomp has Sand Veil. <laughs> I really don't like resorting to accuracy and evasion strats, but this genuinely slipped my mind. Essentially, Garchomp is at plus one evasion as long as it's in a sandstorm, but we got really lucky to avoid both attacks. Anyway, I let off with Garchomp and Azumarill. Flygon and Gigalith both go down to a few Dragon Claws and Play Roughs, but I decided to switch into Magnezone since Garchomp is Scarfed, and I knew that I might need to resort to Earthquake in order to win the battle. After Raihan Gigantamaxes, Azumarill takes down Sandaconda, and we did some decent damage with Thunderbolt before Magnezone gets taken down. It was surprisingly actually able to live a max knuckle, but after going down to a second one, Duraludon's plus two, so that could be a little concerning. Thankfully, Garchomp was able to come out, outspeed, and then take down Duraludon with a Choice Scarf Earthquake. We do get a critical hit, just on Azumarill though. <laughs> Just my luck. Speaking of luck, can we talk about how crazy it is that I ran into seven Duraludons on Route 10? That's a 1% encounter for each of them. Am I really that lucky? 
No. Turns out, Magnezone's magnet pull ability actually brings Duraludon's encounter rate up to a whopping 51%, so unfortunately, I'm not as lucky as I want to be. Marnie gave us absolutely no issues. Galad was able to knock down Lyperd with close combat, Altaria took out Scrafty with a few moon blasts, Galad came back and took down Toxicroak with Psycho Cut and Warpico with close combat, and then Magnezone took down her Gigantamax Grimmsnarl with Flash Cannon. The semi-final match against Hop was actually a lot closer than I'd like to admit. Galad took out Dubwool with a close combat, but we unfortunately got paralyzed by a body slam. Magnezone took out Corviknight with a Thunderbolt, Azumarill took down Snorlax with a few play roughs, and here's actually where I made a terrible decision. I ultimately decided to leave Garchomp out of this battle in order to avoid possibly getting closer to the level cap of Oleana. So I decided to let Azumarill stay in as he sends in Pinkurchin. We were not able to take it down in two hits because it was too busy cursing up a storm over there, so Pinkurchin took down Azumarill, which was probably our best answer for Inteleon. Magnezone took down Pinkurchin, but Inteleon took down Magnezone with a Max Quake, Talonflame with a Max Geyser, and actually did not take out Gallade with a Max Hailstorm. After setting up the Hail, Gallade hit Inteleon incredibly hard with a Crit Leaf Blade, but as we go down, all we have left is Altaria. Now, as you can imagine, we had to go back and do this fight again, because Hop has Icy Wind, which is quite effective, easily taking us down in one hit, or so you'd think. I have no idea why, but Hop just didn't go for Icy Wind here. He went for a Dark Pulse instead. He unfortunately flinched us, but fortunately we see that the hail that he set up previously was actually to his detriment as it knocked out Inteleon. That was really close. I'm actually amazed we had made so many close calls in this run. Oleana was pretty easy as well. Talonflame was able to take down Frostlass with a Flare Blitz. Magnezone took out Milotic with Thunderbolt. Garchomp took down Salazzle with Earthquake. Talonflame came back out and took out Serena with two Brave Birds after breaking through Infatuation. And Garchomp took down her Gigantamax Garboder with two Earthquakes. All right, home stretch, let's finish this. BD gave us no hassle like always. Mawile went down to a Thunderbolt from Magnezone as he sends out Gardevoir, who just hangs on from a flash cannon. Uh, yeah, expect me to say that a lot in the remainder of this video. <laughs> Rapidash fell to a flash cannon as well, but I expected him to take out Magnezone with his Gigantamax Hatterene, but instead of going for Max Flare to definitely take us out, he goes for a Max Mindstorm instead. So we survived, but we left the battle with this lingering question of, just how bad is this game's AI? Magnezone absolutely obliterated Ness's team. After taking out Golisopod with a Thunderbolt, I switched into Gallade to take out Barrascuta with a Leaf Blade since it knows Drill Run, and that would have definitely taken out Magnezone in one hit. After Barrascuta goes down, Pelipper, Seeking, and Dreadnought go down easily as well. But again, I have to question the AI because Nessa decided Max Darkness two times was a much better alternative than a rain-boosted G-Max Stone Surge. So many weird plays have been done by our opponents in this run. I, 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 I'm genuinely confused. Alistair was actually a lot closer than I would have liked. Garchomp wasn't able to take out many of his Pokemon with Crunch, sadly. Dust Noir went down to a few Crunches, but it lowered our speed drastically by constantly going for Rock Tomb. So after we took it down, I switched into Talonflame for Chandelure in order to avoid the Will-O-Wisp. But of course, Chandelure just barely hung on after a second Brave Bird and took Talonflame down with a Shadow Ball. I always forget that Talonflame is not that strong. My memories of Gen 6 OU are clouding my base stat knowledge. Altaria came out and took down down Chandelure with a Dragon Pulse. Cursula went down to a single crunch from Garchomp, and Poltegeist, again, just barely hung on. So in order to save as much health as possible, I sent in Magnezone to take it out. After Poltegeist got taken down, Garchomp hit Gengar with a critical crunch, and it just barely hung on. And now that I'm typing this script, I'm wondering to myself, why didn't I just go for Earthquake? Garchomp and Magnezone get taken down by G-Max Terror, but Roserade is actually able to come in, survive a Max Darkness, and then take Gengar out with a Shadow Ball. Raihan was actually pretty simple at the beginning. Gallade was able to take down Torkoal with a few close combats, the first of which it barely hung on from. Like I said, expect me to say this a lot. Garchomp came out and took down Turtonator with two Earthquakes, but after taking a Dragon Pulse, he's hurt pretty badly. Azumarill then takes out Flygon and Gudra with a single play rough, as he sends out and Gigantamaxes his Duraludon. He hits us with a Max Steel Spike, which we live, but since it raises his defense, our play rough doesn't do a lot of damage. He then hits us with a Rock Fall, which we do live on 2 HP, but we missed a play rough, so the Sand Storm took us down. In order to prevent him boosting his defenses further or raising his attack, I sent in Talonflame to bait out the Rockfall and set up a Tailwind, allowing us the ability to definitely outspeed his Duraludon. Gallade came out and hit it with a close combat again, leaving it just barely hanging on, and then Garchomp took it down with an Earthquake. Do I really need to even talk about the Rose fight? He was pretty easy. Talonflame took out a Scavalier, and then Gallade was able to set up and sweep, taking out Kling Clang, Perserker, 
Ferrothorn, and Kaparaja with a plus two close combat. All right, so if I'm being totally honest with you, I'm actually really scared about fighting Leon. We have a very balanced team, but with our habit of just missing the KO on multiple occasions in just the finals, I did not believe success was going to come on our first attempt, but let's see what happens. So he starts off with Aegislash, and I started off with Roserade since it seemed like the best thing to handle it. He starts off with King's Shield, and I should have just gone for Toxic Spikes predicting that, but it went down in two Shadow Balls. Cinderace is out next, and Azumarill was able to take it down with a few Aqua Tails, which surprised me. I didn't expect it to live, but then again, I am also pretty underleveled, so I don't really know what I was expecting. After Cinderace goes down, he sends out Dragapult, and this was actually what I wanted to happen, but things didn't entirely work out as planned. Dragapult just barely hung on from a Dragon Claw from Garchomp, and brought us to about half health thanks to Dragon Breath. Once Dragapult goes down, I actually decided to stay in with Garchomp as he sends in Haxorus. This was meant to bait out the Outrage, and then I'd switch into Magnezone to tank it, but I forgot that Haxorus hits like a truck, so Magnezone didn't even get a chance to attack before going down. Only reason why it didn't go into Azumarill is purely because I know that this thing has Poison Jab, and we're already at low health as is. I sent in Talonflame to set up Tailwind as it gets taken down by Outrage, but we do get the Flame Body to activate, and looking back on it, I think this is the first time that that's procced this entire run. Anyway, we send out Galley to take it down with two close combats. Seismitoad's an easy Oko with Giga Drain from Roserade, and out comes his Charizard. One miss or one wrong move can result in our loss, so we really need to make sure that we proceed with caution. With Garchomp still alive and Scarfed, I sent it out to outspeed Charizard, and we land the first Stone Edge. It does loads of damage, and then he hits us with a max overgrowth, which is perfect. I have no idea if he would have been able to outspeed if he had gotten to plus one with a max air streak, but we outsped one final time, landing a Stone Edge, winning us the run. I'm actually really sad that this runs over. Wally has got to be one of my favorite rivals just for how far he's come with his independence in Gen 3, and he's got a really fun team to boot. A great balanced team with quite a lot of move variety, actually. We actually still missed out on a ton of moves that we could have used, even from level up. Like, did you guys notice that Talonflame still hadn't learned Steel Wing yet? Don't think it would have done us many favors by the time we got it, but I digress. Regardless, this is probably one of my favorite challenge runs that I've done on the channel, and I strongly recommend it if you're interested in trying it. I didn't expect to have as many close calls as we did, but it was a great kind of tension to have. I could not wait to keep streaming this challenge because I had so much fun with it. I'm not sure when the next challenge run will be. I'm anticipating this video to come out relatively soon before Scarlet and Violet come out, so maybe I'll wait to do another challenge run until I finish that game, and for now I'll just do some highlights from my time playing the game on my Twitch channel. At the time of writing this script, there's like three or four weeks left till it comes out, so I might be able to squish in one more challenge, but you guys should be following me on Twitch anyway if you haven't done so, and join the Discord server as well. With that, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.